So um, as we transition to the message here today, I wanted to share with you guys. Let me, let me ask you a question. Have you ever really wanted um, to do, wanted to do something that you knew was wrong or embarrassing or you didn't want other people to find out about it, but you still wanted to do it? Yes or no? All right, it's like three honest people here. Come on. I know every single one of us here sometimes, like, I really shouldn't be doing this, but I, or I'm going to do it. For some of you, it might have been pretty serious. For others, it's like, I shouldn't have this, you know, this candy late at night or, or whatever it is, right? But, but I know that most of the time we have this thing, you know, our conscience is telling us, you should, I don't think you should do this. I don't think this is, this is a good thing. I don't think you should, you should get this... Uh, get this going but you know what you do it and you hear this voice inside your head don't do it don't do it don't do it you do it anyway you know it's wrong but you still do it and it could be anything it could be sexual sin could be pornography it could be gossip could be lying Anger, stealing, maybe something hidden like pride or, or idolatry of the heart of some sort. You really want something. We know we should resist, but we do it anyway. And if you've experienced it, and, and I think most of us have experienced it, then you know how attractive and powerful that urge can be. And so the Bible actually shows us this, this ugliness of sin that we end up in when we follow that desire. And it's really cool to see the beauty of God's salvation, of who He is, and be, when we look at His salvation as a gift to us, when we see His beauty and love and grace and holiness and perfection, then what happens is it really underlines, underscores, points out the ugliness of sin because it's in contrast who God is. You see, when we are in sin... When, when it comes to talking about sin and understanding the ugliness and the nature of sin, we can never be too shallow in that understanding. In fact, it's the other way around. There is a danger in not understanding the severity of it. And it's, it's really painful and, 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 and it's heartbreaking seeing so many churches just focusing on the feel-good stuff. You know, oh, it's all about positive feelings. People are tired. They want to come to church just to be encouraged. And yes, that is the place to do it. But we absolutely must understand the ugliness of sin. Because if our understanding of it is too shallow, it will cause problems. I've shared this with you guys before. I had a, I had a problem with my ankle one time. I uh, stepped into a hole playing soccer a long time ago. And then what happened is, um, you know, just swelled, swelled up, lots of pain, went to the doctor. And he's saying, oh, you can step on it, you're fine. So I walked on it for a month. It was painful. And then I went back and said, no, 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 something is not fine. It's been like four weeks now. And they did some more work and found out it was broken and I had surgery on it three days later. The diagnosis was incorrect because there was a shallow examination of what was going on. Our sin is like that. If we don't examine our sin closely enough, if we don't think about it and really understand the nature of it in depth, then the diagnosis of our life is going to be wrong. And so, that's what I want to talk about today. I want us to really understand some of the nature of sin so that we don't have a shallow understanding and therefore the wrong diagnosis of the problem. We know that everything that God has created has been impacted by sin. Everything. When sin entered this world, everything got impacted by that sin. When Adam and Eve made that choice in the garden, when they rebelled against God, sin entered the world and it had an impact. That's why there is death. That's why there is decay. That's why there is all these things that we're seeing in the world going on today. 
So what happens when sin spreads? What happens when sin actually starts growing, either individually in your life and in your habits and in your personal time, or in the community, church, city, country? So I want to take a look at it uh, from the story of Cain and Abel. And we all know that story. If you've, if you've grown up and, you know, going to church and, and if you've, you've attended Sunday school classes, you know the story. But I want to look at that story from the perspective of spreading of the sin and, and have some takeaways as a result of that. So here's the first thing I want us to look at when we're talking about sin and the story of Abel and Cain. Number one. Sin spreads with evil desires. If we want the wrong thing, it's only a matter of time before we start doing the wrong thing. You see, when we look at Genesis chapter 3, we, we see the story of Adam and Eve, and we see the banishment of them from the garden after they have sinned. They rebelled against God, Sin entered the world, they cannot be in God's holy presence anymore, and so they're expelled from the garden. And then Genesis chapter 4, it kind of begins with this hope. And what is this hope? Well, Eve gives birth to two sons, right? And, uh, and, and, and they give credit to God for help with that. And uh, in the beginning of that chapter, God is fulfilling his, his promise to give son to Eve who would defeat the serpent, right? <clears throat> so it's, it, that's the hope. We're kind of seeing the start of that promise coming true. So let's open up Genesis chapter 4 and read verses 1 through 7 together. Now, <clears throat> Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So we see something interesting in this passage. We see that sin in this context here is something that actually can be contained. It is something, there is something we can do to limit the impact of sin in our life. We can't eliminate it altogether, but we can certainly contain it and have an impact on it. It's, and, and what we see is that it is a disease that went from Adam and Eve to their children, and it's continuing to go for, to every person in every generation and every child. That lie, it, the same lie that found its way into the heart of Adam and into the heart of Eve, it is also the same lie that found its way into the hearts of their children and us by extension. It's a disease that gets passed on from every father and every mother to every child that was born. That's why there are no good people. That's why even if we're talking about younger kids, just at some point, uh, they're not at some point, they're just as sinful as adults. And that's the nature of humanity. We have a depraved heart because sin entered into who we are, this terrible disease called sin. And so we see the spread of sin. We see that, that sin is starting to spread throughout the earth, and we see that happening through Cain's jealousy. And here we have two sons. They both offer sacrifices to God from their respective areas of work. One is, a, is, is growing and raising animals, and one is growing crops. Cain gives produce, and Abel is giving up some of his flock, but God only accepts the sacrifice of Abel. Why? Why? 
Well, the answer is not in that particular passage of Genesis, but if we go to Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 4, we can see why. Here's what it says. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. You see, Abel's offering was accepted by God because he offered it in faith. That's why it was accepted. When Cain realized that his offering was rejected and Abel's was accepted, what happened? Something started brewing in his heart, something dark, something consuming. He started getting angry, and eventually that anger, that frustration, that dissatisfaction, it grew into action, and it grew into murder. He was following his parents footsteps with progression of that sin but what's really amazing is God's reaction in this God in this situation and his grace is showing Cain and or giving Cain another opportunity He's showing him grace. He's showing him mercy, and he's doing something incredible. He, we see that God was showing grace to them before uh, Cain's sin, and then he was offering him a way out even after that. So, so think about it this way. When Cain was tempted, as he started having these things getting fixed up in his heart, God is giving him the opportunity to find strength and get rid of that temptation. But even after Cain sinned and killed his brother, God is still giving him an opportunity for repentance. That's a lot of patience with us. That's a lot of grace. God takes sin very, very seriously. And he encourages Cain to kill that sinful desire within him before it killed him. And this part is really easy to miss because we really focus on this, this part of, of murder of Abel, right? We might think that, well, humanity is kind of a lost cause. God's already given up. There is nothing that God's doing. But no, he's actually working in the life of even Cain who is murdering his brother. He's offering him grace and forgiveness uh, after the murder. And even before the murder, he is giving him an opportunity to get rid of that temptation. Why? Because God is not indifferent to sin. God is not indifferent to humanity. He cares about each and every single one of you. He cares about what you're going through. And as you're going through these temptations, there is a way out if you just walk towards Jesus. So God was telling Cain to reject the temptation, to master that sinful desire. What he's saying is do the right thing. Rule over it. Don't obey this temptation. Don't obey that command. And I don't know about you, but my guess is that most of you have heard the echo of God's voice through your conscience when you're trying to do something wrong. You know it's wrong. You sense it. You know the Holy Spirit is letting you know that. And sometimes you just say, eh, nah, it's okay. Sometimes it happens after the fact. But friends, these desires, these evil desires and these temptations, they lead to sinful actions. All of us have been down that road, some more, some less, but at some point I'm sure it happened in the life of every person here. By the way, temptation on its own is not sinful. It's what we do in reaction to that temptation that makes it either sinful or not because we know that Jesus was tempted, but Jesus never sinned. So it's, it's how we react to the temptation, what we do with it makes it sinful or not. So God cares about the act of every single sin in our lives. And he speaks truth to us in love. And he, in, in our sinfulness, is speaking to us. And often we reject that voice. And that's what Cain did. Evil actions begin with evil desires. Here's how it looks like in our world today. You want to be rich? You're going to be tempted to 
steal, or maybe work yourself to death, because that's what's driving your life. Or maybe you want to be famous. It's all about fame and Instagram uh, influencing, and you care more about others' opinions than you care about God's opinion. You want to be popular? You will please people instead of pleasing God. What you're thinking will lead to actions in your life. Not always. It's not the law. We're not talking about, you know, uh, word of faith movement here or nothing like that. But whatever, whatever fills your mind will result in your actions. It will overflow out of your heart. That's why the Bible talks about transforming your mind, right? Renewing it. Filling it with the scripture. Filling it with God's word. So Cain's sacrifice was technically acceptable. Grain offerings are acceptable. They were authorized in the Mosaic law. We don't see that as being sinful. He raised up those crops and he gave that offering. So I don't believe that that's why God rejected it. But we can see that this was a heart issue. Because of the way Cain reacted to when God rejected that offering. Let's take a look at 1 John 3.12. We should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Here's an answer. Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. He's looking at his brother he's, and, he, and, and his heart is evil. His brother is righteous and so he murdered him. So this was a heart issue. This was something that was going on in Cain before he brought that offering forward. And so Cain killed Abel because his deeds were evil. He didn't become evil after killing his brother. His deeds were evil before he killed his brother. This was a heart issue, a heart condition. So sin, in this case, the murder, is a result of evil desires, is a result of a heart condition. Cain had a heart condition that resulted in the murder of Abel. We, if we have a temptation that we're following and we're falling into and we're sinning through those evil desires, those sinful desires, it will at some point result in actions that are absolutely sinful. And the sin will spread in the same way it spread then. Cain heard God's instructions to flee temptation, but he did not do it. He didn't listen. His anger fed it. His, his rage kind of gave this birth to sin. It kept going. And so when sin had grown up in his heart, it resulted in murder. And we know that from Genesis 4, verses 8 through 12. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you're cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So Cain gives in to his evil desires, his sinful desires, and he shed the blood of his innocent brother. And so sin begins with these desires, and then it ends with evil actions towards others. These actions, they deserve God's judgment, deserve God's condemnation. But something really amazing happens here, and I want you guys to see it and not, and not miss it. Just as God came to Cain before the sin, before the murder, he came to talk to him after the sin, after the murder. Now think about it. Why? Did God not know where Abel was? This is the creator of the whole universe who knows absolutely everything. He is everywhere. Why would he ask Abel, I'm, I'm sorry, why would he ask Cain where Abel was, fully knowing that Abel was murdered? He isn't just messing with his head. 
An all-powerful God knows exactly where Abel is. An all-present creator of the universe knows exactly where Abel is. So why does he ask? He doesn't ask the question to find out an answer to something he doesn't know. He asks the question because he is giving Cain an opportunity to come clean and repent. He's given him one more chance of saying, listen, what happened? And Cain had an opportunity to confess and repent and say, Lord, I did a terrible thing. Here's what happened. And instead he says, am I my brother's keeper? By the way, this question of saying, Cain, where is your brother Abel? It sounds very familiar. You know when it happened again? Or happened before? When God came into the garden and he said, where are you, Adam? Where are you? Again, does God not know an all-powerful creator of the universe, all-knowing, almighty God, he does not know what Adam has done? Of course he knows what Adam has done, but he is giving him an opportunity to come clean and repent. Friends, same happens to us. When we sin, God does not automatically dish out a well-deserved punishment and discipline towards us. He gives you and I an opportunity to come clean. He gives you and I an opportunity to come to Him and say, Lord, I messed up. I screwed up. This is an addiction. This is a problem. I, I know it's wrong, but I did it. Whatever it is in your life, He wants you to come clean. Just like with Adam, just like with Cain, He's giving you and I an opportunity to start over, to start fresh with love, and grace, and unfortunately Cain responded not with repentance, but he responded with a lie. He says, I don't know. Of course you did. You killed your brother. He lies to God. Are you lying to yourself? Are you lying to God when he speaks to you? Because you see, our God is not just a forgiving God. He's also a just God and a righteous God. And there are consequences of sin. There is, there is justice for doing things wrong. There is justice for wrongful actions. And God does punish Cain. But even through that punishment, God's love is evident. Even through the punishment, he shows grace and he shows mercy. It's incredible. What do we do if we've fallen into temptation and we have sinned? How do we face these failures over and over? Some of you may be struggling with the same thing over and over and over and over again. How do you prevent the guilt and the shame of sin from destroying you, from, from paralyzing you, from living the kind of life that God wants you to live? It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy even in the church that Christians become paralyzed because they give up thinking, I, there, is, there is nothing to be done. And they live the kind of lives that God did not intend them to live. That they are not living the kinds of life that God called them to live. It's a sad, very, very sad kind of life. This living that's just full of sin and dependencies and brokenness. And it's especially sad when we look at the cross and we see the price that was paid and it's offered to you and I. It can be different. It can be completely different because the price was paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, friends, sin progresses from evil desires to evil actions. And again, uh, sin spreads with evil desires and then it progresses, right? It starts with evil desires, so we have this temptation, we think these things, it results to anger, it results in, 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 in all kinds of feelings that, that are overcoming us, like they did with Cain, and then at some point, they're leading to actions. Murder, stealing, pride, envy. The third thing I want you to take away from this message is that Sin can be overcome by God's promise. 
You see, the, the, the amazing thing about sin spreading is that yes, it starts in your head with your desires and your priorities and what you want to do. And yes, it progresses. It will grow if you don't overcome it. It will start spreading and result in sinful actions. But here is the good news. The good news is that sin can be overcome by God's promise. That's the only way. You cannot just be more self-disciplined. You cannot just be, you know what, I'm just going to make myself better or I will never do this again. You will not have the strength. You will not have the power to do that unless you come to God and He is the one who does it through you. He is the one that gives you strength. He is the one that gives you the ability not to be a slave to that sin anymore. So let's look at what happened next with Cain's example. And as we're reading this passage, I want you to look at how faithful and loving God remained to Cain, just like he was faithful to Adam and Eve. Genesis 4, 13 through 16. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden." There are a couple of things going on here in this passage. First, Cain is crying and expressing sorrow. He's expressing regret. But listen, when tears of regret are flowing, that's not necessarily repentance. And that's where so many people go wrong. They get busted. They get caught in whatever they were doing wrong. And, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But what they're really sorry about is that they got caught. They're not really sorry that they've broken God's standard. They're not really sorry to the point of saying, I'm going to leave it all behind and never go back to it. I I am ready to follow Jesus and turn 180 degrees and start following him. What they're saying is, I am sorry to experience the consequences of the fact that I screwed up. So in today's context, if a husband cheats on the wife... I'm so sorry. Well, he's sorry he's about to get a divorce. He's sorry that it became public knowledge. It's, uh, he's sorry that the whole family found out, his church knows, and, and what are people going to think? Is he sorry that he broke the heart of God? That's what Cain is doing here. He's crying, he's sorrowful. But notice, it is a very self-centered kind of thing. He's saying, oh my goodness, my punishment is huge. I'm going to die. People are going to kill me. Now I'm going to be wandering all over the earth. I'm a fugitive. Nowhere is there any kind of real repentance. There is just regret for the consequences of his sin in his life. Friend, I don't know about you, but I see this all all the time as part of my pastoral ministry. People are often sorry they got caught and they're sorry for the consequences of their sin, but they're not sorry for the sin itself. Listen, it'll never get fixed. If that's what happens. Why? Because as those circumstances get better, you'll go back to sinning again. And hoping that you're not going to get caught for a while. And then after a while, you'll get caught again. And you'll, oh, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done this. And then, you know, certain days, weeks, months later, you'll get back to it again. Because you are regretting it, but you're not repenting. They're not the same thing. And that's why you have people that are doing the same thing over and over and over again. But there is no real change because it's not powered by the Holy Spirit. It's powered by a person regretting the fact that it happened to them. Now they're genuine. They're not faking it. 
but they're genuinely sorry for themselves and the circumstances they found themselves in, not the fact that they broke the heart of God. Regret leads us to weep like Cain because, quote, the punishment is more than I can bear. The punishment is great. And it's a selfish reason for Cain's sorrow. It's not that he can't bear the sight of his brother in blood being on the ground. It's not that he is sorry that he's offended God's honor, God's glory, God's holiness. It's not that he's fallen into temptation. No, it's about his own punishment and the consequences of his sin. Cain's focus is on himself and on his circumstances. That's a fake repentance. That's just regret. It, yes, it may include sorrow, tears, regret, maybe even promises that I'll never do this again. But ultimately, the heart of this fake repentance is selfishness. Because you feel sorry about the consequences and the punishment that is too great to bear for you. We're sad because of the consequences of our sin in our lives. Instead of the harm our sin has caused in our relationship with God. Genesis chapter 4 verses 25 and 26 show the second thing I want to point out to you guys here. Even through all that, even, even through all of this, God is showing grace to Cain, and he's saying, no, 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 listen, we're, you're not going to get killed. I'm going to put a mark on you. I'm going to protect you. There is still an opportunity for Cain to restore that relationship with God. And more so, God is actually showing Adam and Eve a, a, a beautiful uh, continuation of the promise that he's made to them. Look at what it says. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he, killed his, uh, and he called his name Enosh. And that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. God has given them another son, through whose lineage eventually Noah would be born. And all of humanity would be spread all over the earth. So even through this punishment that Adam and Eve have experienced as a result of their sin, God is continuing to show his grace and mercy. That's God's reaction. That's his heart. And that's what I really want you guys to see this here. He showed justice on behalf of Abel when he punished or banished Cain. But he also showed mercy to Cain when he put the mark on him. He was dispensing justice, but at the same time being gracious and merciful. Isn't God incredible? He banishes Adam and Eve from the garden because of their sin. That's justice. But he's also clothing them with animal skins. He's, he's giving them clothes. He's providing for them. He's caring for them. God punished Cain, but protected him from violence from others. God's actions here, they're all pointing to a day when we would receive mercy through the sacrifice of His Son. Just like God was showing mercy and grace to all these people, He's showing us grace and mercy today through His Son, Jesus Christ. And yes, God is fulfilling His justice on the cross. He is outpouring all His righteous wrath, the consequence of all of our sins on His Son, Jesus Christ. That's justice. But He's showing us love, that that's even possible, because we deserve death. Bible through all of it, from Genesis to Revelation, points to a God who in love is withholding the full extent of his punishment until some point in the future so that the most people can be saved. So that you can be right with God. Maybe some of you are thinking or hearing this voice of God in your life right now through different circumstances, through different people. 
Where are you, Adam? Where is your brother Abel, Cain? What's going on in your life? And listen, God knows the answer. He's prompting that to you so that you have an opportunity to respond to his grace and mercy that he is showing today. Just like through the lineage of Seth, thousands of years later, the promised son would be born. At the cross, the blood would be shed again. And this time, it would be the blood of the promised son, Jesus Christ. Not just shed by sin, like in the case of Cain, but his blood would be shed for sin instead of by sin to restore our relationship with the Father. Hebrews 12, 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks, listen, a better word than the blood of Abel. You see how it's all connected? Isn't that incredible? Abel's blood, blood that was shed by sin, was crying out. It was crying out because justice needed to be done. But Jesus' blood, blood that was shed for sin, for my sin, for your sin, it speaks and it speaks a better word than the blood of Abel because justice now has been served. Because Jesus died on the cross. Because Jesus paid the price. And if you're in Christ today, all of your sins have been dealt with. It's just. It's been paid for. They've been poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross. Friends, as Christians, we see ourselves in the person of Cain. We see what Cain has done. We see his sin. But we also see ourselves in light of the cross of what happened on the cross The cross where God has shown the fullness of his justice. Where all of his his wrath was poured on Jesus Christ. And the debt has been paid for. The sin has been paid for. And the cross where God has shown the fullness of his mercy. By showing grace to us through his son. So those are the three things I want us to walk away from with here today. Number one is that sin spreads with evil desires number two that sin progresses from evil desires to evil actions and three sin is overcome by God's promise and that promise is Jesus Christ and so if there is anybody here today who is not restored in their relationship with Jesus I want to give you that opportunity maybe God is tugging on your heart today saying what's going on where are you at friends don't ignore that Don't answer like Cain did. I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. Don't hide in shame and guilt like Adam did after he sinned. Come to God in repentance because the price for your sin has been paid for. You just need to repent and commit your life to Jesus. May that be the case with every single person present here today. Amen? Let us stand and pray.